Hey, this is Aaron. And this is Kristen. And this is the Drive Mode Show. Whoop! It's happy holidays time, Aaron. We're going to talk about cars you can put a bow on. Put a ring on it. Or a bow on it or something. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, the, the trope in car commercials this time of year is the cars out front with a bow on it. And uh, the implication being, hey, look, I made, you, I made a major financial decision and didn't include you on it. I'm uh, <laughs> really happy about it anyway. <laughs> and I'm glad because I would have issues with that. <laughs> Maybe it was like, I don't know, the 1957 Bel Air Resto Mod with all the modern conveniences in it. Then I'd be like, oh, awesome. Thanks. <laughs> I, I, I don't think anybody would say, oh, why that? I, I think pretty much everybody would be like, oh. <laughs> that Porsche Taycan. No, no. <laughs> yeah, please, please don't buy that $100,000 car without letting me know first. So kind of what we're doing here is we're, we're being exceedingly superficial. We're basically basing the, our choices on looks. At least I did. Uh, it's almost entirely based on looks because if I base it on what I want in my garage or in my driveway, all of them would look like probably well-used rally cars and off-road vehicles. Um, Those would look good with a bow on them. Maybe, but this is the cars that we that I've chosen here, and I think probably you have. It's based a lot on the looks of the vehicle would it look really good with a giant bow on the hood or on top of the car um and we also limited ourselves to current model year so 21 or 22 models uh, and then we limited ourselves by price tag we did not go over a hundred thousand uh, dollars and the reason for that is otherwise our list would all be lamborghinis and aston martins and stuff <laughs> and uh you know we're not jeff bezos so <laughs> and that's a good thing in a lot of ways right um i don't have a rocket ship either no i kind of want a rocket ship but <laughs> all right <laughs> you know inside i'm still like eight so we're... <laughs> <That's> so, <true. laughs> why don't you start off the list what's your first one on your list all right the first one to think that would look great with a big red bow on it is a Mazda MX-5 because you could put a giant bow on that thing and it's awesome and I've got one right now in my driveway and it's a manual and it's super fun so I'd want a bow a little bow on the manual on the on the gear shifter okay. big bow right on top of the roof and I really like this deep crystal blue but you know my favorite paint color in the whole wide world is Soul Red Crystal Metallic. Yes, that is well established. Um, <laughs> now, the MX-5 didn't make my list, uh, but I do really like that car. Uh, the only reason it didn't make, didn't make my list is because I have two other, three technically, other sports cars on my list. Um, and I think all three of them are a little better looking uh, in terms of just the overall body look. Uh, but the MX-5 is a lot of fun. Uh, it's just, it's such a great, just a really well done car. And I'm, I'm kind of sad that it's, it's uh, step sibling over at Fiat isn't being made anymore um, because that was a great little car as well. Yes, I love whipping that Abart, that Fiat Abart 124 around the track. It just slips and slides and it's so much fun. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, first one on my list, I think, is the second one on yours. It is the Lexus LC500. Excellent choice. Man, that would look so good with a bow on it. And Lexus was the first company to start using big red bows in their commercials. So, mm -hmm. they should be really number one, probably. And I, I think I chose this car and put it at the top of my list because I, having driven McLarens and others, I still think this car is the prettiest car I have ever driven. Uh, it is, and I would even count some very old vehicles that I've driven, um, you know, classics, because this car is just beautiful. Everything yes. about it. Holy crap. 
<laughs> it's really beautiful and it's it's wonderful to drive. I've driven both the hybrid, which I love because the range is something like 600 miles and it's ridiculous. I could mm -hmm. drive hours north to Dallas and back and still have gas left over in the tank. But the V8 is also really fun to take on the track. And very, very well optimized. So the V8 is, it growls a little bit, but it's relatively quiet and in the background under normal driving. Uh, but as soon as you push the pedal, it lets you know it's there. And it's just so sonorous, just makes a great sound and feels really good. Um, it never feels jumpy. That's the thing about that car. Most sports cars, they have a jump point where they feel like they're launching. And the LC doesn't do that. It's smooth all the time. It's just a wonderful design. And the look is just. It is. It is the gray poop of sports car engines. <laughs> it's like. <laughs> So that one was second on your list, right? Yes. Yes. So what's number three? For me, it's the new Hyundai Santa Cruz. And that is because that car has such a cool shape. And I wasn't sure what to make of it at first. You know, it was like a, a vehicle mullet in my mind. Mm -hmm. You know, business in the front, party in the back. But I drove it for a week and I fell in love with it. It's such a fun vehicle. It's so affordable. And it's, it's zippy. It's plenty zippy enough. There's two engine options. I wouldn't go with the base model. I would definitely go with the turbo engine. But it's it's just got so many thoughtful touches that make it a great car for right now. Okay. So I haven't driven the Santa Cruz yet. Um, it did not make my list. In fact, I've only seen one in the wild. Uh, I've never seen, I've only, otherwise I've only seen it at car shows. So uh, but I, th I really like the design. I like the look of the vehicle. It's not pretending to be anything other than what it is. Um, it's, it's a fun-centered, uh, uh, fun so it's aimed towards fun, uh, pickup truck. So it's a car-based, fun-centered pickup truck, which I think is exactly the market that Hyundai can hit. Um, I think if they tried to go with a serious pickup truck, what we would think of as a work truck, uh, they would fail. Um, Toyota has learned that. Honda has learned that. You have to aim for a different market, and there's a huge market of pickup truck buyers available um, that are not looking for that day-to-day -day work truck. So, and I think, like I said, the look, it's, it's similar in appeal to the Avalanche. Uh, when the Avalanche was popular, it has a similar appeal to that, but for today. So it's not, you know, that 1990s look. It's more today. I agree. I think you made some good points. You know, when I drive this thing around town here in Austin, there's a whole road crew that just stopped what they were doing and watched it go by. They're like, mm -hmm. <laughs> like what is that? You know, I haven't, I haven't seen any in the wild here. So it's unusual. It's cool. It's quirky. And I think they nailed it. So mm -hmm. put a bit, stick it in my driveway. I'd be happy. Right. <laughs> uh, number two on my list. Somehow we skipped number two. Anyway, number two on my list is the Toyota Supra. Um, and I chose that car because like the LC, it is one of the prettiest vehicles I have ever seen especially in the bright colors they have for it. The yellow is wonderful for that car. Uh, and I'm also glad that Toyota chose to uh, have BMW build the car and Toyota designed the, you know, the look. Um, because I think that that combination is great. Uh, if Toyota had done it on their own, Toyota has, has a tendency to be very conservative. And so I feel like it would have been much less than it is. Um, if they had done it by themselves. Uh, but I think it's better looking than the Z4 that is its uh, quasi-sibling. Um, I think the Z4 is a very good-looking car, but I think the Supra is way better looking overall. I agree, too, and it's also more accessible. You know, I saw, I was at the, what auto show was it? When when they relaunched it, and Akio Toyota got up on stage, and he was so excited about that thing coming back and it really has a it has a huge enthusiast fan base mm -hmm. uh similar uh to that is a 
the Nissan Z, the new one, uh, which is coming in 2023. It's not on my list. I, I made it an honorable mention because it, it's not technically out yet. Um, but same idea. I saw it. Long, I saw it uh, when it unveiled to Nissan Z enthusiasts at ZCon, and the crowd was crazy nuts over that thing. Everybody wanted to go up and try to touch and feel and and look and everything. I was lucky. I got some time in the garage with it before it was unveiled to get photos without a bunch of people. Um, but and then they took it out on the track and it led victory laps with all of those people. There were hundreds of Z cars there and fair ladies and uh, you know just a, a wonderful lineup of vehicles, Datsuns and Zs, and uh, just people were crazy over that car. And it's for the same reason. It's a heritage car. It's a car that is still being made. Like the Supra, it's something that everybody remembers. And there are enthusiasts that are really, really in love with that vehicle. Agreed. That one deserves a bow. So since we skipped my third one, we'll go to, or my second one, we'll go to my third one, which is the new C8 Corvette. Um, I, I love the look of this car. Uh, it reminds me of sports cars of the 80s that were from Europe, so the Italian sports cars of the 80s, uh, but with the modern uh, Chevy design to it. it. So it has that that uh, Stingray front end, which is it's beveled like this instead of being a flat. Um, so it's it's not the wedge shape of the Lamborghinis and stuff of that time period, uh, but it has the same double hump in the back. It has the separate rear window. It has the little things that remind me of that. And the mid-engine design is beautiful. And the engine itself is almost perfection, especially if you get the upgrades to add the, the uh, better exhaust and other things. It's just a really well-done car. And one of the few sports cars with an automatic transmission that I greatly enjoyed driving. Yes, they did a great job with the automatic transmission on the C8. And I think, you know, my personal opinion is that this is the best Corvette generation in decades. Decades. I was yes. not a fan of the, the slope down nose of the 90s vets. Mm -hmm. And I think that this one is is really beautiful. I agree. They, they knocked it out of the park. So when I, uh, when I drove it, I uh, showed it to my friend who has a 1974 uh, his is the 454 model, which they didn't make a whole lot of. And uh, we parked them next to each other. And there were a lot of comparisons to be made there. But the re in, in terms of look, the old style Coke bottle, which was my favorite, you know, those, those uh, late 60s and early 70s vets, that was such a great and iconic look for that car, especially for our generation. Then this new one, it has hints of that same shaping, uh, but it's it's a lot more uh, rear heavy because the engine is back there and it looks a lot more aggressive. Uh, I think my favorite three generations of the Corvette are the very first one and then that uh, third one uh, towards the end, so in the in the, um, the late 60s and early 70s, and this new one. Uh, they're they're just such beautiful, beautiful designs so and affordable <laughs> yep my dad had a 1967 corvette before i was born in uh, milano maroon and i know i've seen pictures of him with that car and it's it's really beautiful it was beautiful and i think since then i was less of a fan i totally agree with your assessment of the generations mm -hmm. We're at number four, right? Yep. So number four for me is the Land Rover Defender. As we've talked about before, we are a big Land Rover family. We've got a 2000 Range Rover in the P38 body style. It's currently getting a new transmission after almost 200,000 miles. And then we have a 2013 LR4. Now, I drove the new Defender at the Land Rover Trek Tour competition this fall with a bunch of other media and we took out the high lift jack we hooked up the winch we did all kinds of fun stuff in that thing and it's incredibly capable it's 
it's the OG. It's it's got all the off road capability that you could ever need, and I loved it. Yeah, um, a lot of people now they they pan uh, Land Rovers and Range Rovers um, because they're they really are luxury vehicles, and they say you know they 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 gave up capability in order to go to the luxury route, and I completely disagree with that. Uh, every Rover I've driven has been extremely off road capable for its class and size. Um, probably the least capable in the entire lineup is the Evoque, and I would still put the Evoque up against any of the uh, similar sized Jeep models uh, for off-roading. So it's, I mean, it, they're, do, they're still very, very capable. Um, now, the, I really, really like the Defender, and I think, um, I think it's very worthy of a bow for Christmas. Um, but I haven't driven one. <laughs> you definitely need to get behind the wheel. I've taken it off-roading a couple different times, and it's it's just as good as the old Range Rovers have been. Mm -hmm. um, it's a different shape, for sure, and we are big fans of the P38 generation. But I still I still think this new Defender is spectacular. It's well thought out. Yes. Um, we did a walk around of it at uh, Chicago, right. I believe it was. So I'll try to link to that down below. Number four on my list is the Mazda CX-30. Oh, yes. Yes. And I think for my money, I would say that the CX-30 is the best looking of the Mazda lineup. So even with the little MX-5, I would still say the CX-30 is the prettiest vehicle in Mazda's lineup. It's just wonderfully balanced in terms of its overall silhouette. And uh, the weight balance is very well done. Mazda's been good at this anyway. Uh, but to make up for the kind of fat rear end, right, because it's an SUV, it has a longer hood. So it has kind of a saloon style hood, which balances everything and makes it look really, really fine. Uh, and then Mazda has been going upscale anyway. So their interiors are very premium. And this has the best stereo I have ever heard in automotive, bar none. Um, and I've been to events where custom tuners are building stuff, building stereos, and they did not sound this good. Sitting in the CX-30 in the upgrade package with the upgraded stereo from Bose is like wearing headphones. It's wow. wonderful. Yeah, and you got to go to the launch. So you talked to the audio people, and they told you about how they built the car basically around where the, the optimal speaker placement would be. Yes. Uh, so normally, uh, like the front uh, mid-range speakers are forward of the, of the uh, pillar, so part of the body framing, forward of the pillar. This time, they actually built it into the pillar um, because that creates better sound as far as the resonance goes. Uh, which is a unusual thing to think of, but they were optimizing placements to create that perfect sound and to minimize bounce, which is what ruins sound. Uh, so it was a really interesting, and I'll try to link that down here too, because that was a that was a really thoughtful and uh, very informative as to how audio works. I think Mazda is often overlooked. Is, is a great value brand because they put so much effort into that Zoom Zoom engine mm -hmm. as well as interiors. Now, neither one of us is a huge fan of the command control knob, but you're totally right about the CX-30 audio. And as we, you know, as we talked about with Miata, that's a wonderful little value car. That's a sports car for every mm -hmm. person. And it just, like I said, it looks really good. Um, Mazda's lines are very, very well done, and uh, I think the CX-30 really exemplifies uh, Mazda's design language, especially in crossover SUVs. So we're, I think we're at the end of our list. What's your number five? My number five is the glorious SUV BMW's X5 plug-in hybrid. It's technically the BMW X5 xDrive 45e, which is just ridiculous to say. <laughs> but that is 
probably it's if not the best it's in the top two or three suvs i've driven in the last year i really enjoy the hand controls for the volume and the mm -hmm. audio i love the layout inside i think it's so comfortable and it was a, a great driving experience and i'm not a huge bmw fan i'm, I'm not a hater but I'm not like, oh, BMW, you know, this one really impressed me. So I've driven the X5 in both its uh, standard six cylinder model, um, which has that wonderfully designed uh, straight six that BMW uses. Very, very smooth delivery. Uh, and I've driven the plug in and I vastly prefer the plug in. Um, you have a little more power right at the beginning, uh, which is important, especially just around town. And also, you just have uh, uh, a more balanced feel to the vehicle overall. The battery placement and other things just kind of balance a little better. Uh, but you have, you have, I think it's about 40 miles, if I remember right, 40 or 45 miles of electric range, uh, depending on your driving habits and a few things. Uh, but this new generation with the larger batteries is really, really nicely done and beautiful to look at. Um, Again, BMW, just like Mazda, they've mastered silhouettes. And the silhouette of any BMW, if you just see the lines, you know that's a BMW. Uh, there's never a question. So. Yeah, and you know, the big fat grill doesn't bother me either. I mean, that's controversial and people yeah. hate it a lot. But it doesn't. Don't... Because the drive is so good, I just kind of right. forgot. And I don't. So here's the thing. I do not like. I call it the beaver tooth. I don't like the giant grill on most BMWs, but the X5 is big enough that it doesn't look bad. Um, it looks like it should be there. It looks fine. Uh, you get into a smaller vehicle, it starts looking really huge. I've also heard people use terms like pressed ham and other stuff for it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, my number five is a concession to my also also to my preferences uh i gave number five to the jeep wrangler rubicon 4xe oh yeah uh, for two reasons the first one is the wrangler rubicon the, <laughs> the second one is the 4xe has a color package um where the blue highlights and the red paint really pop it looks really really good like that so you have uh, you have the blue highlight on the hood, you have the blue uh, on the logo, and then you have the blue uh, toe pins and other stuff, and they look really good in contrast because it's kind of a it's a lighter blue. It's not quite baby blue, but it's a very light blue, and it's in contrast to the bright red of the paint on the that you can get, and it just looks really nice. It's so phenomenal, and then it's Jeep Wrangler, so it's gonna. It's going to make any list I make <laughs> that's not for fuel economy. I really think it did a good the 4 by e and I'm looking forward to driving the Jeep Grand Cherokee in the 4 by e version as well, which should come out early next year. Mm -hmm. I'm a little disappointed that the uh, 4 by e Grand Cherokee does not have, they will not offer that with a three-row option. Um, that's my only major disappointment there. Uh, but with the Wrangler 4 by e you get all the goodies and no bad uh, with that. You get really good around town fuel economy if you're even using fuel. Because um, you have about 20-ish, 20 to 25 miles of range, uh, electric only. Um, and if you are smart enough to think of it and push the button to force the engine to do the work when you're on the highway, when you get to the off-road, you have all that electricity to drive around in there. And be, then you get the benefits of a diesel without having a diesel because you have tons of torque and it all happens early. The only Jeep model that matches the 4xE, the only Wrangler model that matches the 4xE for torque is the giant 392 uh, with that huge eight cylinder um, SRT monster, <laughs> monster engine in it, um, which I did not enjoy. Um, because it's really front heavy. Um, the 4xE also has batteries in the in the back towards the rear axle, and that helps to balance a lot. So it's just a wonderful design in every way. And 
iconic Jeep. So the doors still come off, the windshield still drops down, you know, the top still leaves. You can do all that stuff with it. Nothing changes. All the goodies. So Santa, if you're listening to us, these are the ones that would look really good in our driveway with a bow on it. Although maybe consult with me first. <laughs> or at least, you know, cover the payment. <laughs> <laughs> So there were some that I wanted to put on this list, but they just, you know, I had to limit to five. And uh, that, that really kind of kind of cramped the style. I wanted to include like Volkswagen ID4. I wanted to include the Audi All Road um, because they're just really pretty cars, I think, uh, especially in certain color packages. But in the end, the five that I came up with, those are the ones uh, that really definitely made my put a bow on it list. Your list, I think, though, is a little bit better than mine. <laughs> well, and there's one that I would have added to the list, and that is the Cadillac CT5, the Blackwing, which is getting rave reviews all over the place. And I would not be unhappy if somebody stuck a bow in that and put it in my driveway. It's pretty sweet. So Awesome. So this is Aaron. And and this is the Drive Mode Show. See you soon. Happy this holidays.